You're listening to The Virtue Podcast, brought to you by the Great Hearts Institute. Good conversations around the great conversation. Welcome back to The Virtue Podcast. I'm Rob Jackson of the Great Hearts Institute. I am truly excited to introduce today's guest, Jonathan Peugeot. Jonathan, welcome. I got to give a little bio here before we get started, all right? Because I think folks need to know about your, your, your backstory. You graduated with distinction from the painting and drawing program at Concordia University of Montreal, but you became disillusioned with contemporary art and then discovered icons and traditional Christian images uh, as a part of your own journey. Now, studying these forms, Jonathan rekindled his love of art, from which he developed a passion for wood carving later studied theology and iconology, and Jonathan has become uh, quite uh, in demand. I mean, he's been commissioned for carvings from across the globe. He's become a writer and public speaker at the same time, giving workshops and conferences. With his YouTube channel and podcast, The Symbolic World, he now continues to advance the conversation concerning symbolism, meaning, and patterns. And we find this in all sorts of things. His conversation partners include some pretty serious thinkers, some public intellectuals like Jacob Howland, Bishop Robert Barron, and even Jordan Peterson. So Jonathan, if I may, without flattering you, uh, a Renaissance man seems truly fitting to describe what you're doing. I'm thrilled to be hosting you today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I like medieval man better myself. You know, I, I, just have that, I just have that one bend in me, you know. Uh, but I, I, it's true that I do kind of aspire to uh, having a broad vision of things, you know, and yeah. so I, I love too many things. It's sometimes painful because I try to do them all at once. Well, and that's that's actually what I'd like you to explore with us today, how bringing all of those varied interests, right? Again, artist, author, public speaker, YouTuber, whatever, you, your subject matter is just virtually, I mean, it's extravagant. I almost want to use the word prodigal. So how do you bring together such disparate areas of practice into a coherent whole? And so I would say the the basic idea is to understand the symbolic worldview that that I've developed with my brother, but in some ways is a rediscovery of a ancient thinking. You know, kind of how the medievals thought of the world as this cohesive uh, world of manifestation of, of patterns and of of a like the world reality rhymes is the best way to maybe think about that. Hmm. And so a kind of liturgical way of seeing the world. Uh, and so in some ways. This this vision of symbolic patterns and how the world manifests itself in patterns, you know, mm -hmm. so from stories to images to even, you know, when you tell your wife how your day went, this is always following certain types of patterns. And those patterns are in some ways the way we experience the world and the way we make meaning out of it. And so it, that seems to be the thing that binds everything together, because in some ways it's a very incarnate way of seeing the world it's not just like theories up here in the world it has to play out it has to play out in practice and so for me it's not just about thinking about these symbols but the fact of actually being a carver and making these images for churches in communities that use them in their liturgies and in their lives is is what connects it all together so in practice but then then ultimately it becomes a way of seeing the world which helps you make sense of pretty much anything if you just spend some time putting your attention on it huh and attention. Uh, that's yeah, attention. sort of a, a commodity in, in short supply these days. So it sounds as though some of what you do as an artist really does equip you to attend patiently, caringly, right, to to the form that, 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 you're, that you're making as an artist. But I'm interested then, since practice informs your view of the world, as you describe it, how does your life as an artist inform your public speaking and maybe vice versa? In other words, how does your engagement with popular culture influence your art, if indeed it does? Uh, I would say not so much. I would say, well, at least not the icon part making, like the okay. icon making. The icon making really is me kind of tapping in or say plugging into, you know, an ancient mode of, of seeing and of being that was handed down to us. So it's like kind of plugging into a world that I know is wiser and more uh, has more insight than I. And then that actually flows out and then informs the other things I'm doing, you know. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. the, my writings, you know, the fiction that I'm doing, uh, you know, I, I, I do everything from making prints to T-shirts to all kinds of popular images that, that, that appear in popular culture. But those are actually ultimately 
derivations or lower lower forms of the things that I've learned in studying the tradition of uh, of iconology, but also you know the let's say the patterns in scripture and liturgy and in in the, but also in myths as well in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. Well, then if it flows the other way, right, that your art and the focus on traditional forms or, or those perennial forms that, yeah. that that have lasted influences the way you approach popular culture. What is it you think that's going on to, to, to produce the kind of response that you're getting? I mean, you've got literally thousands, even hundreds of thousands of viewers and those who are interested. What is it that really is drawing them in to this yeah. conversation that you're hosting? Well, I think people are feeling that the world is fragile right now. They're feeling like things are kind of off kilter and, and it's difficult for for people to make sense of what is going on around them, what is going on in their own lives. And this is true just in terms of their own vision of themselves, but then also the way in which they can participate in reality. Uh, and so I think that the way that I speak about the world is, is in some ways a bridge from the secular back into the sacred space. You know, I talk to a lot of cognitive uh, psychologists, to scientists, to people that have different uh, that have a more kind of technical uh, scientific way of seeing. And, and uh, I'm able to say things in a way that helps them understand the meaning of ritual, the meaning of prayer, the meaning of participation, you know, why, why your family meal is a kind of dance and why that dance ultimately scales up and can become something like, you know, going to church or participating in a, in a sacred uh, ritual. So it's, it's, it's like, I'm putting, uh, let's say, uh, let's say, um, a trail of bre a breadcrumbs back towards a way that's more a way of thinking and a being that's more integrated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, interestingly enough, the the origins of psychology, or at least modern psychology, uh, which you know maybe it's 150 at most, 150 years old. Uh, the, the 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 granddaddies, if you will, of Freud and Jung and others, they were very familiar with the mythology. They've woven it into their works. I, I'm wondering to myself. Is this something that uh, that you're tapping into, even in the modern experience with psychology, having recovered a bit of 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 the the appreciation for how we we need to and and have to tell stories, and that's in fact a part of our our soul, our soulful yeah. makeup. I think so. I think that that it's just hard for a lot of modern people to understand it, and so even let's say if they think of Freud and Jung. Ultimately, they might think like this is all about, you know, your, psych your psychology and your desires or whatever, but it has little to do with day to day reality. Hmm. But I think with modern cognitive uh, science, modern cognitive psychology, what you're able to show is that actually the very ma manner in which you perceive reality, like even the fact that you're able to see cohesion across the multitude and multitude of, of, uh, of information that you're, you're constantly surrounded with is already patterned and that mm -hmm, those patterns. Mm -hmm are captured in in the ancient stories. They're like a distilled, the stories, those stories are like a distilled version uh, of a pattern that you can kind of see because they've been distilled and brought and, and collapsed together in very short little aphorisms or short little images. And so it's a, so I think that that's something that helps people under, say, oh, well, it's not just about some really intellectual thing that I have to think about. It's like, no, you know, it's, you know, when you get up and you, any anything that demands your attention, necessitates pattern making and mm -hmm. those patterns are not arbitrary they're they they are coherent and we can talk about them and we can expose them to the world you know i was i was browsing your website and obviously thousands of visitors are doing this i was pleased to see that you have some readings right i mean we're a bookish type here uh, at great hearts and within the classical movement but you referenced folks like cs lewis and jrr tolkien uh renee gerard and then, of course, you went to the primary sources, the Bible, the church fathers, but you were engaging with like postmoderns. I mean, Derrida, oh, yeah. right? And, and contemporary historians like Tom Holland. And man, you are all over fairy tales. So I'm really interested in this, I'll call it interdisciplinarian approach, but I, I don't know if that even does it justice. Could you take us a little bit through the process whereby you came to see these sources as in the conversation together? Yeah, so I think it... A modern frame to understand it is 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 Heidegger. I think is a modern kind of way to see what's going on. Is that the positioning that Heidegger brought us back to, which is the phenomenological point of view, um, 
I think it informs the it informs the possibility of reenchantment is the best way to understand it. It it gives us a way into uh, you know without denying the technical understanding and the more scientific uh, discoveries that have been made. It brings us back into ourselves and say and says you know like sure I mean sure the, I believe the Earth is round and it goes around the sun, but the most true part of that is the sun coming up in the morning because it mm -hmm, actually mm -hmm. legislates my day. It actually manages my life. And so it's not that it's, it's not that the, the first one is false, but the second one has priority in my experience. And so bringing it back to human experience and talking about it that way, that's in some ways is the frame for how all of these things come together, especially C.S. Lewis. Like the idea that you would connect C.S. Lewis with Jacques Derrida seems strange, but both of them actually entered into that space. Derrida, uh, takes on a phenomenological point of view quite a bit. It's just that Derrida does it from the point of view of the margin, you could say. It's like mm. Derrida is kind of like a little jester on the margin that's showing you where meaning breaks down and where coherence breaks down. But that's actually part of the big pattern. You know, we had gargoyles on churches for a thousand years. We have funny, silly things in the marginalia of medieval manuscript, right? We've always had uh, things on the edge poking at the meaning. Mm -hmm, so we mm -hmm. can recapture the full uh, story if we also even include uh, the notion that on the edge things falls apart and that that's actually part of the big the bigger pattern. So that's how these things kind of connect together. And, and in terms of Holland, I think that, you know, he is one of those people that's realizing the inescapable need for a, a kind of common mythology. And he knows that that's Christianity. There's no way around it. And that mm -hmm. not, not only that, but... It, without it, all our morality will start to fray because it's really just it's on top of something which at the outset might seem strange and, and weird. You know, some you know, crucifixion, resurrection, virgin birth, all these strange images that that aren't just purely rational. But ultimately, uh, our morality is founded on these more story type tropes. Mm -hmm. Fascinating that your connection to concrete practices, you, you just gave the example of, uh, you know, sort of a heliocentric world, but one that is experienced very much in terms of the sun's ambit around around the, the observer, right? So the practice, the, the, the experience, right, of the sun coming up in the east and setting in the west does not contradict uh, the, the heliocentric model that we've come to understand, the, the way that we've seen the world through our observations. But at the same time, it, it does create some natural tensions. So I'm, I'm really interested in the practices that you're describing and the abstractions, the symbolic representation of the world and how those two relate. So let me just ask this question. How do you think your work in terms of these popular contemporary perceptions around the physical world is connecting or helping to connect folks back to a mental spiritual reality that you that you are uh, conveying with your work. Yeah, well, I think that the the point of view, like this reincarnation or this 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 call to people to go back into their experience and see it as primary, right? Understand mm -hmm. that my experience is primary. It doesn't mean that all these other. It's not a relativization of reality. It doesn't mean that it's just what I think and what I believe, but. This, this this perception, and it's a universal one because everybody has this perception of reality, uh, you know, from the point of view of the viewer, that is what informs your daily life. It informs the way in which you move around the world and the decisions you make. It is the one which precedes scientific discovery because all the scientists also exist in bodies and have this, this priority of experience. But what it mostly does is it helps us recapture stories that without that perception, are just silly, ridiculous, superstitious stories. Mm. And so all these ancient myths, all these ancient descriptions, you know, you how can you read Dante without that? If you if you read Dante without that, then it's just what is this super like who is this character that's going up into the heavens and going on planets? And it's like a weird science fiction uh, thing that <laughs> loses all its meaning. Yeah. But if we recapture the experience, then we realize, you know, if you if you realize what the sun is. In your experience and what it does and how it provides light and how it provides uh, the pattern of your existence then you realize the way that the ancients described the sun and the kind of spiritual aspect of the sun is is not ridiculous at all 
Mm. Or the way that the fact that Moses went up a mountain to encounter God. And we think, well, that's silly. Like, what is he getting closer, you know, to the clouds? What, what is he doing? But when you realize that your experience of up and down is a real experience, it has real consequences. And that, you know, if you, if you stand in a room and, and someone steps up on a chair, all of a sudden that person becomes the point of reference of everybody. Right. They stand mm -hmm. above and they can see him and he can see everyone, but everybody around him can't see everything. They just see each other. And so it's it's an actual real experience of transcendence to rot to lay to rise up above others physically. And so mm -hmm. then you can understand like, well, that's why Moses has to go up a mountain. So it's it's just getting people back into their body and experiencing helps you to without negating the scientific technical world. We can still now go back into these ancient stories and connect with them and find them meaningful and powerful for our lives. It, it seems to me as though you're saying that the subjective or the experiential of the individual is somehow captured or caught up in uh, the, the mythic and, and that, that maybe in a collective sense, that's what the, that's what the great wisdom is of, of the fairy, of the world of fairy or, or of the great myths, that, that collectively we find in those things something of our, our commonality, our common humanity. Uh, if that's the case, as you said a moment ago, most people look at fairy tales and, and, and mythology as just being that silly stuff, right? That has has very little bearing. Is there a way in which your work might help us to to really probe how how those tales are bringing together uh, the human experience? I'm I'm really interested in the dynamic between the subjective yeah. that doesn't just run off into some sort of relativist relativistic uh, romp. And, and an objective reality. How do those, how are those kind of bridged by the mythic? Yeah. And so I think that that's really the, the best way to, the best way to see it is first of all, to understand that the notion of the subjective as being arbitrary is, is a, it's a fancy that we can't hold anymore, huh. right? The subjective is not arbitrary. The idea that, that you have the capacity to create completely arbitrary meanings is ridiculous like even from a materialist point of view even from like a purely evolutionary materialist point of view this Descartian uh like opposite we can't have it anymore it just doesn't function hmm. and so the idea that it, the, the best way to understand it is mostly to understand that the experiential right is where we first create patterns right because it has to do with our survival like without without being able to justly or to appropriately judge a pattern will lead to me dying, right? If I don't see that the cliff ends here, then I die. And so mm -hmm. there's like a, just a basic uh, like evolutionary survival thing, which makes it that our pattern making has function. Even the ones that we think are, uh, even the ones that we think are scientifically false. Like I said, the idea that the sun comes up in the East, yep. like that, if you get rid of that, you, you, your whole life will dissolve. Like you really need to pay attention to that pattern because it's <sighs> very important to your mental, psychological uh, family survival, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so what happens with the mythic is a good way to understand why the mythic looks the way it does is that you can understand it as a type of contraction. And so hmm. you think about it like, um, think about it like you have your a love story in your life. You know, you meet someone, fall in love, you have children, whatever, like you have a, a kind of love story. Mm -hmm. And so that love story is interspersed with all kinds of stuff that's happening that has nothing to do with your life story, right? That has nothing to do with your love story. You know, you're going to work, you're sleeping, you're doing all this other stuff. And so a story, like a movie, what it'll do is it'll contract all the elements. So it'll take elements that are just related to the love story, and then it'll compress them together into one place. And so then it's almost like it's almost like an overdose of the pattern. And so because of that, you can see it and it and it pierces you in a way that your love story in its in its length and its kind of drawn out thing won't pierce you as brightly. And so that's mm. why stories can reveal reality to you because they're contracting elements together and not just like the, the love story of your life, but let's say. All these love stories of all these people, there are some love stories that seem to be more captivating, more have more reality in them. And so those are the ones that we'll remember. Those are the ones that we'll want to compress. So we come up with certain tropes to tell these stories. Now, think about that, but think about that over like 40,000 years or mm -hmm. you know, 20,000 years. And so 
at some point, what happens is that even the categories have to be contracted. And so you can't say, you know, it, the, the image of something will end up getting pushed into a way that you can be remembered. And so think about like in a, in a movie, you have that too. It's like in a movie, the good guy and the bad guy actually have to physically duke it out for you to really care and remember it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. In reality, that's not what happens. You have different people and whatever. It's all, it's all very messy and very complicated. But when I see Superman and his foe, like actually fighting with fists, I'm like, that is revealing an aspect of reality to me. So now contract that even more. And what you end up with is something like, you know, like a serpent in a garden with the two first humans mm -hmm. contracted even more. And you get things like, you know, the God of heaven that throws thunderbolts or whatever, like it. And, and I'm not saying that it's, and I want to be careful that people don't think that I'm denying the reality of these stories. I'm actually affirming it very much. I'm saying that that contraction makes it more real, not less real, makes mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. more relevant and not less relevant. I like this notion of contraction or compression or sort of bringing it into a concentrated form. Uh, I was reminded as you were saying this of, of Richard Wilbur, a great American poet who says in one of his one of his lyric poems lying, these are the great lies told with eyes half shut that have the truth in view. And as you were saying a moment ago, that there's a distillation, right? Or a compression of all of the complexity of life, a contraction in that sense, right? It doesn't get everything, but it gets the essential things. Yeah. Uh, it gets the, the, it's, it gets the most salient stuff. Uh, to I, which, would, I would really yeah. object to the lie. I would object to the lie part because what is this truth that he's referring to? Is he referring to some forensic description to a police officer yeah. or like some journalistic a detail that you get it's like that is fine but i that will be forgotten like it the, the the forensic detail in a crime case will not be remembered because it doesn't have enough ontological weight yeah and so those the things that are remembered and contracted and and pushed forward those are the ones that are true like and and it, interestingly enough and we don't have time to expose yeah. the wilbur poem but i think he's saying exactly the same yeah, thing yeah, yeah, you yeah, are yeah. and he's playing with that he's that playing term. with that yeah, yeah I get absolutely it. So I, I, I just want to switch gears a little bit, although I think it relates because the conversations you've hosted are fascinating. And recently you had Professor Jacob Howland of the University of Austin and John Verveke of the University of Toronto uh, working through Plato's Symposium. Now we're, we're big fans of Plato around here, so maybe you can tell us, since many of our listeners pay attention to uh, how to read Plato well, what were a few highlights from that exchange? What insights did your trio produce from that classic dialogue? I mean, the the dialogue actually started because I had uh, I had made fun of the uh, of the myth of the round people. You know, I'd kind of yep. mock that because I felt like in the symposium they also mock they also mock it. You know, a little bit. But then Jacob really wanted me to see the parallel, and I saw it immediately. The parallel between the the myth that is told about the round people and their separation, uh, their desire to reconnect together, and the story of Adam and Eve and the the creation of Adam and Eve and how Adam is, is cut and that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that he becomes two people. And in some ways that, 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 uh, that there were relationships between the two. Uh, and so that was really the, um, the, the, the thing that spurred the discussion. Um, but then there was also, you know, the, the issue of the transformation of desire, which is usually the way that we understand the symposium, especially as Christians, you know, in the discussion between Socrates and Alcibiades and how Socrates seems to be presenting the hint or the, the beginning of an ascetic move, you know, where mm -hmm. he has this sense in which the withholding of desire, that if Alcibiades can withhold his desire for Socrates or that Socrates can transform that into a desire for the higher good, um, and so we ended up talking quite a bit about that and how in some ways that ends up informing Christian virtue and the way that Christians understand self-sacrifice, uh, you know, kind of pointing towards the, the possibility of sacrificing yourself for a higher good and how that that um, that avoids the problem that ultimately Alcibiades, you know, ends up uh, betraying uh, Athens to, to Sparta. It's like mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. something about his pride and about his desire and about his kind of in, be being inflamed that way and not being able to get over it, which leads to him basically betraying the city. Well, you said earlier, uh, you know, concerning Tom Holland, the historian, uh, that there are things he's beginning to discover, right, as, a, as an unbeliever, 
that there's something deeply rooted in, in our culture. Uh, and, and he at one point openly says in his most recent volume, you know, I, I'm reading through these histories, studying very closely and discover I'm not a Spartan. I'm not a Hellenist. Right? Yeah. I'm sort of I'm repulsed by this because I'm on this side uh, of a much different of an epic. Right. So tell me, in terms of reading your symposium and, and with your interlocutors, were there any particular insights there that that, that read from the Greek experience? Uh, without necessarily the, the the direct overlay uh, of a Christian or Neoplatonic reading, um, I mean, obviously, there's the, let's say there there are some things in the symposium which, at least as a Christian, I'm not I'm not uh, particularly attuned to. But, you know, the whole uh, <laughs> the, the the boy the whole boy men thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're not attuned to that, and so that's what's interesting about about. Christian history is that the Christians were able to go back into these texts and to say, you know, this is something we don't need, but this is an insight that we can capture and we can keep. And we can do that without feeling like we have to justify everything about Plato or about Socrates or about the Greeks and the way that they that they live their lives, but that we can rather, you know, uh, pill, the way that uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa talks about it, right? The idea that we can steal the pillage the Egyptians, right? Mm -hmm, we can mm -hmm. we can take the the gold of the Egyptians. And so I think that's the way that I that I see it. Um, but for sure when you read Plato, there are you know there are very mysterious aspects, you know, that that for us today are difficult to 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 connect to. And so but those are how can I say that those appear to me more like a spice, like something that is that's difficult to integrate. And so mm -hmm. I, I tend to want to look at the aspects of, of, uh, of Plato that, that I can use in my life and that yeah. I can apply to my life today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I said a few moments ago, you're a bit of a phenom when it comes to the YouTube channel. So you've become a dialogue partner with Jordan Peterson. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's a pretty big deal. How do you characterize the interplay of your work with that of Jordan Peterson? I think that we're I, the way to see it is I think we're kind of on the same team. We're not playing the same <laughs> roles. Like we're not, we don't have the same position on the team. Uh, and so, you know, I encountered Jordan Peterson before he was famous in 2015. And I was really impressed by the way that he, by he, the way that he used Jung and Dostoevsky, um, you know, and the, the types of things that he was saying, I thought, and the way that he talked about scripture, I thought was quite powerful. And so I saw that he had something that I didn't have. He had more reach into the possibility of reaching into secular culture and explaining some of these things that have been misunderstood or forgotten or that we, we've we lost the way of, of understanding a lot of these, these old texts that, that, that have a different language. And so we ended up starting to discuss and to exchange. And it's really, um, you know, I talk with Jordan, it's, uh, it's unbelievable, right? It's, it's like a, it's like, electric current you know we just start going and going and going we have all these these ideas and all these insights that go back and forth uh and so that's the way that i that i see it he's what he's far more on the secular side than i am mm -hmm. uh trying to kind of pierce this trying to understand but has such a deep respect for for uh, for christianity whereas i'm on the inside like i'm really i really am a christian mm -hmm. uh and i'm kind of on the inside and we're discussing from let's say one side of the of the door to the to the other yeah yeah well, it's a it's a neat exchange, and folks are gonna, I'm sure, take a look. Uh, hopefully, after we after we get finished here, we'll have some show notes and recommendations from you as to where they can get started. I did want to mention uh, your most recent publication. You graciously provided me a copy of your latest book, God's Dog. This is a graphic novel. We talk about secular, a graphic novel that retells the story of Saint Christopher, and it's a part of a series that's that's coming, as you've shared with me. So, what prompted the selection of this subject? And what are your ambitions for the unfolding of this project? The beginning of this, the idea of St. Christopher is that there's a secret that people don't know about, which is that St. Christopher, who's one of the most famous saints in Catholicism and in Orthodoxy, you know, you see him, you see him on like the dashboard of drivers at taxis and everything. It's usually a large man with a little child on his shoulder uh, that this that there's an ancient tradition which has been kind of forgotten or dismissed or hidden in corners that he's actually a cynocephalus, that he's, he's a dog-headed man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are all these legends about dog-headed men, you know, from the, the tales of Alexander the Great up into the Middle Ages, this idea that there are these monsters on the edge of the world, you know, these dog-headed creatures 
that we're not sure if they're human or not, right? right. Uh, and so I really thought that that would be a great way to explore a, a kind of Pinocchio story of a of a monster that becomes human, of a some a creature of the edge which learns to to find its way, you know, in the in the world of men. And so the the story, what it does is it explores all the strange aspects of Christianity that a lot of the modern people don't want to talk about. And so we have St. George who kills, who's the killer of the dragon. We have giants. We have the Leviathan. You know, there's also St. Simeon the Stylite, who's this monk that stood on a pillar for, you know, 60 years. And so, and so it's like, it's all these, all these strange images that come together in a kind of epic, in an epic tale, uh, you know, that, that is in the biblical world and in kind of the Christian world, but is really using tropes of fantasy and uh, and fiction that way. Well, and and so you chose it in hopes of perhaps revitalizing some of these great a great legend like this. But uh, I mean, I noticed my own kids. We have a we have five children, but the the ten year old and the fourteen year old boy just devoured this thing. I laid it down on my desk. They picked it up. What's this? And then they wouldn't they wouldn't give it back, right? So it was a tug of war between myself and my teenager. What 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 were you hoping to do in terms of? Yeah, well, look, I, the thing is, is that I grew up in a I grew up in a Christian world, and I'll be honest with you, I grew up in a Christian world where all the Christian stories were horrible, <laughs> all of them, and and all the Christian movies were horrible, and all the Christian narratives were just like veiled propaganda, and I and I just I just wasn't interested at all in any of that stuff, right? You, you know, you would get this book there, this this or that thing. Uh, and I noticed that the only people that were successful were people like C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. And the reason mm -hmm. was what was because they were doing doing it using a mythological world. And so they were kind of bringing these beautiful, powerful Christian messages through using mythological imagery, imagery of fantasy. Um, and so that just percolated in my mind for a very long time. And I also I always wondered why it was that C.S. Lewis or Tolkien didn't want to do that with the the mythological strains in scripture. Mm -hmm. And I think that in some ways maybe they were afraid, they were worried that it would cause problems or or maybe they didn't think about it. And so I always kind of I think that what we're trying to do is something like the the New Testament to CS Lewis and Tolkien's Old Testament, which is that we're going to tell mythical epic stories that use uh, the legendarium of Christianity itself. Mm -hmm. And so there are so many legends that nobody knows about. Wild, crazy stories of, of monks that live with animals. Of Like there's so many strange stories in Christianity. And in our modernizing of Christianity, we've all pushed those away and we've forgotten them. You know, mm -hmm. wild stories of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that ultimately through a series of of, of, of uses and transformations becomes a bronze serpent and then, you know, ultimately becomes the cross and that Christ is being crucified on the, the tree. It's like these are fantastical stories that have actually very deep meaning in them. And mm -hmm. so can we create a uh, kind of fant fantasy type stories that use all these strains of the, le the Christian legendarium without apology, like without, Without trying, without trying to apologize and not mm -hmm. trying to give a message, but rather a, a, a kind of celebration of these stories and and how they, you know, how they connect to our humanity, rather than just how they can make you go to church or or do this or that. Sure, <laughs> sure. Let's say, yeah, know that they stand on their own merits, right? That's right, and exactly. That they really are compelling. Um, I, I was thinking to myself as you were speaking that there's something analogous here to the hagiography, right, uh, of of yesteryear. Yep. Some of which, quite honestly, leaves me dry. But if you look or read the work of Louis de Waal or, or, or a great biographer, or, or and Louis de Waal in particular is really opening up, uh, in, in a sense, his imagination as he studies a particular uh, saint or a particular uh, episode, right, from the, from the Christian past in a way that is much more vivid uh, to, to the mind's eye. So it seems like what, what you're trying to do is take maybe a, a thin gruel uh, of, of storytelling that's been handed down or it's been lost perhaps and revitalize it, right? To bring it back to life. Yeah. And also, I mean, there are certain things that the modern narrative offers that are really useful that weren't necessary in the ancient times that the medievals didn't see as something, you know, the medievals could 
read the hagiography and get really excited about it and just love these characters and they they would you know celebrate their feasts and there were massive you know there were like a so great associations that would celebrate the feast of this or that saint and so this is something we don't have access to right but what we have access to in the modern world are certain storytelling tropes for example you know character arcs uh you know and also complex character arcs where you have multiple characters that are joining together on on a larger arc these are modern uh let's say developments uh in storytelling that are very very useful and so can we take, like you said, some of the legendary and some of these wild, crazy legends that were told very simply, uh, let's say, in the Middle Ages or in earlier times, and then weave them together in more kind of complex, psychologically satisfying stories? And yeah. I think that's definitely the case because the images are powerful and, and we've forgotten them. So, And the images, in your case, in God's Dog, are literal. So you've got this graphic novel, right, that sort of leaps off the page. Uh, yeah, well, there's I something about that, too, that I like, because the story of St. Christopher is like a story about the margins. It's a story about, like, a weird monster character with monster killers and all this stuff. And there's something about the graphic novel and the history of the comic book, which also places it in that. It's always suspicious. It was always seen suspiciously, you know, by authorities as something which would would kind of warp the 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 culture, would warp young people, would stop them from reading or whatever. And so I also want to play with that in terms of, you know, elevating a graphic novel to a level that is that is more like literature as well. Sure, sure. Well, you've also got plans, as I understand it, to keep working on and bringing classic fairy tales back to the main. You're going to begin with Snow White, as I got a preview of that. Uh, what can we expect from Pajot Press in the next year or two? Yeah, so yeah, we are actually start. It's called the symbolic. It's called Symbolic World Press. We just we just actually registered it like a week ago. Okay, and uh, and so the plan is we have we are going to have eight fairy tales, and uh, we're starting with Snow White. We're starting the Kickstarter. We're going to kickstart it as a as a project to kind of fund all the other books on June sixth. So people can check that out on Kickstarter, you know, if they want to. But the idea is. You know, we've seen now in the past 20 years, there's just been a desire to always retell our ancient stories in an innovative way, which I get it. And often those innovative ways are kind of deconstructive, right? We're, we're trying to show the hidden power mechanisms. We're trying to show, uh, you know, the, the, we're acting with a very cynical tone towards our own fairy tales. Think of Into the Woods uh, mm -hmm. and, and Shrek, for example, that is doing that. And so... I thought that it seemed like it was actually now time to recapture the stories themselves and do it in a form of celebration. And so what we're doing is we're going back into the stories and I'm also addressing some of the narrative issues from the original fairy tales that we that that seem mysterious to us trying to not just not necessarily solve them simply but rather elevate them and try to help people see the meaning in these stories. So the idea is to have a book that you can read to your kid in an hour. And and that for a child is perfectly great. They get the story of Snow White. They 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 can experience it. It's beautifully illustrated. But then an adult, if they are attentive, they can also gather some insights that they had never thought were in that story, uh, but that they might recognize if they if they're just a bit subtle and attentive to what's going on. Well, I I got it last night, as I said, as I was reviewing it because. Three times the Widow Queen makes her attempt on the life of Snow White, and there's something in each of those visits, right, that yeah. alters the story, the direction of the story. So it's also yeah. has anybody seen like in Snow White? Like everybody knows that she eats an apple and she falls right. asleep, right? And so it's kind of there. It's like obviously there seems to be a relationship between that and let's say Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Or also it's this weird thing about beauty and an apple. And it's like, then you, then you remember, right. The Trojan war and how it started. Mm -hmm. And it's like, like all these references that are kind of there in the fairy tale. I wanted to bring them out and maybe show how they're actually showing something very cohesive, which connects to as much to the Trojan war as to the origin in the Bible. So. Yeah. Those, the, what, what caught my attention of course, was the fact that uh, the dwarves, were themselves transformed at that second attempt, right? Because yeah. where they'd been, the thieves and the and, and the vagabonds, they suddenly went to work, right, as miners as a result of their encounter with beauty. So tell me this, Jonathan, folks who are viewing this podcast and others who we hope to get to are probably going to want to explore your work at the Symbolic World. Where would you suggest they begin the journey? Like, is there a helpful primer? Is there a favorite video of yours? Where do we get started if we want to go deeper? 
So the best place to go is the symbolicworld.com. That's really where everything is held together. On the website, you'll have access to my videos. You'll have access to articles written by all the all people that are studying kind of the symbolic thinking. But there's also a, even now a community if you sign up that you can join in the discussion and you have people that are discussing literature. Uh, you know, uh, there's there's a group now starting this summer that are going to read C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy together and kind of try to see what the symbolism that C.S. Lewis is, uses. And so there, there, there is there on the symbolic world pretty much everything you need to kind of discover this type of, this way of looking at the world. That's fantastic. We'll be sure to put that in the show notes, get folks started. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll get you out here to Phoenix uh, to, to speak to our audience in the future. So That'd thank you so much, Jonathan. Yeah, thank been... you. Thank you for this opportunity. All right. Take care.